liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here in the 11th hour on the weekend, as promised. I almost didn't make a, I almost didn't make it, but here we are, late on a Sunday, recording after all. Um, Saturday turned into a busy day, and so I, uh, yeah, so I didn't do it yesterday. And then um, I just got through cleaning up cat vomit, so I, I'm, in a, I'm in just the right mood, just the right mood for this. You know, I'm, a, um, I'm allergic to cats, but I have two of them, and I was brushing one of them out earlier today, and I was like, okay. When I was done, I couldn't breathe. And uh, I thought, well, why did I do that? And I thought, well, I've got this, like, for the next hour, I won't be able to breathe after brushing out the cat. Um, but if I didn't brush out the cat, I would never be able to breathe. So I guess it's a, I guess it's a weird trade-off. Um, and that kind of seems relevant in, in some respects. But I suppose uh, we'll, we'll jump right into it here. Uh, And I'm actually going to start us off, more or less, um, with a clip. Uh, This is Joe Biden from his, um, I guess they called it a town hall, uh, a few weeks ago, three weeks ago maybe at this point. And um, yeah, here he goes. And there's a lot at stake. The most important one is the right to vote. That's the single most important one. And your vote count it, and count it by someone who honestly counts it. All right. According to Joe Biden, voting is the most important right. Um, Now, I I would dispute whether it's a right at all, uh, but let's just, uh, we'll take his his path first. Um, And I I hope that you recognize the danger of that, but we're going to go into it a little bit. Um, I mean, the first thing to think about is if that's true, if voting is the most important right that you have, um, implicit in that is the idea that all your other rights, um, the uh, right to uh, you know to speak freely, um, the right to counsel, uh, the right to not incriminate yourself, the right to religion, the right to everything else, all those other natural rights are subordinate to the right to vote. Um, And, of course, what that means is that all those other things can be voted away. As long as you can get 50-plus-1% of the people to agree that, um, I don't know, that your life doesn't have value, then those people can vote your life away. Um, I mean, think about things like, uh, like slavery. If voting is the most important right, then... As long as a majority of the people vote that you should be a slave, then they can. Um, Because the right to your own life is subordinate to the right to vote. It's a very very communal way of looking at things, very collectivist way of looking at things. I think it's dangerous. Um, it, It... makes all the individuals subordinate to the to the group. And while you can make that decision on your own, um, using the power of government to enforce that kind of idea, well, I mean, we've seen the results in the past. Um, starvation and genocide, right? Um, and, you know, of course, a lot of it comes from this idea that democracy is somehow the highest virtue. And... And that's kind of what I wanted to shift towards with this here. Um, let me go back to voting as a right, though, first. Um, again, I would say it's not a right. Um, it requires action on the part of others in order to execute, and therefore I would say it's not a right. Any Anything that you claim is a right has to be something that can exist without the influence of anyone else. In effect... I would say that they they mostly, at least, I can't think of a counterexample, um, they mostly uh, are about being able to do things without the influence of anybody else. 
Um, it's a, most rights are about preventing other people from taking it from you. Um, the right to free speech is about not, is about others not being justified or moral in interfering with your, um, your thoughts and your expression of those thoughts. So, um, you know, what your right is, is you have a right to make your own decisions about your own life. And democracy does the opposite of that. Um, it entitles you to make decisions about other people's lives. And it justifies those in some way. And it becomes an excuse to infringe on the freedoms of others. It, it's not about... It's not about maintaining rights at all. It's about taking rights away and having a reason to do so. Um, and then, you know, the result is that democracy ends up being invoked to justify, like, any act of government. And because it disarms people, right? You know, since democracy is held up as this highest virtue, um, invoking democracy is the reason to take away your rights. Uh, becomes hard to argue against for most people. And, you know, does it still... I mean, even if you... Uh, well, okay, so let, let's take the terror wars for an example. I, I think that, you know, this becomes a, an issue... So I saw... I, I know I'm getting a little tied up here because I have so many ideas, like thoughts running through my head. Um, but I actually heard somebody on a news program a few weeks ago, and I can't remember which one, um, saying, well, freedom of choice is always the best option as long as people make the right choice. Well, then it, it's not about freedom of choice. It's about, um, about getting the, the decision that you want out of people. It's about manipulating people. It becomes the illusion of choice. Um, you know, take, for example, and I'm sure... Everybody out there has had this kind of experience in one way or another. Um, but what I think of is, is like when your girlfriend says to you uh, that where you go to dinner is up to you. Like, uh, you, oh, you choose where we go. And so you pick something and she's like, oh, no, no, not that. Well, okay, well, how about, you know, restaurant B? No, no, I don't want that either. And it ends up becoming this thing of like, well, where do you want to go? And then you get your answer. It's, it's the illusion of choice. Like, if you'd picked something that she wanted, then it would have been your choice. But since you didn't, it becomes not your choice anymore. You chose the wrong thing. You chose poorly. And therefore, the, the illusion of choice is taken away from you. Um, uh, uh, for example, actually, let's go ahead and play um, this clip from de Blasio. Um, and this is obviously just like a perfect example of this kind of thing. We tried voluntary. You know, we could not have been more kind and compassionate as a country. Free testing everywhere you turn. Incentives. Friendly, warm embrace. The voluntary phase is over. Okay. We gave you the option to make the right choice. You didn't make the right choice. And now... We're going to take the choice away and make you do the thing that we wanted you to do on your own, but you didn't. Um, I mean, was it ever really a choice in that case? Doesn't seem like it. And take, uh, you know, the elections are held up. Of course, we've been fighting over this for at least five years, I guess now. Um, now, I remember hearing a bunch of people, because I, I listened to a lot of... of um, and read a lot of left-wing uh, media because that's the majority of it, I suppose. Um, but I, I remember hearing people say over and over again after the 2016 election, saying, I don't know how Trump could possibly have won. I don't know anybody who voted for him. And then, of course, here after the 2020 election, um, I mean, I do know people that voted for Biden, but I'm sure that there are plenty of people around where I live that would say, well, I don't know how Biden could possibly have won. I don't know anybody that voted for Biden. And, you know, there's there's good reason for that. Um, 
but even if you if you take it at face value, if, if you just assume that everything was on the up and up in all elections. Now, like I said, I, I think that there's some level of fraud in every election, but that's a that's a different topic. Um, this becomes the the reason for any other government action. Well, you you chose this, right? Like you chose Trump or you chose Biden. Like this is the this president that's doing these things that you don't like. Well, he's justified in doing those things that you don't like because you you chose this. Like this is what you decided on your own. Now, of course, it's not really a choice anyway. Um, you're given two candidates uh, that are you know essentially pre-approved. Trump may be an exception to that, actually. Um, but you have two candidates that are essentially pre-approved by the establishment. To them, it doesn't matter which one you pick. And they're able to create this kind of conflict down, you know, with all of us um, in fighting about who, you know, R, D, left or right, whatever it happens to be. Um, and people feel like that's the only choice that they have. And... And people don't even make the choice based on what they want. Um, they make the choice based on what they don't want. Um, my aunt, um, years ago, she's like, well, I don't, I don't like Hillary. Uh, I think she's a terrible person, but um, I, there's no way that I could vote for Trump. And this is an understandable position to take. But I, I asked her, I was like, well, what do you think of Jill Stein? Oh, I like Jill Stein, but she could never win. Well, certainly not when all the people that might have otherwise voted for Jill Stein look at it that way. Um, people start approaching um, these elections uh, like a horse race, uh, you know, where they're trying to pick the winner, not choose the winner. Um, and uh, they're, they're making their choice based on uh, trying to limit the damage that the other side could do. And that's not, I mean, is that really democracy in the way that we think of it? And, I, and I'm not saying that democracy can't work. I just don't think that it can work on this kind of scale. I, I don't think that it's productive on this kind of scale. I don't think that enough people know enough about what's going on um, to make good choices because they're not informed choices. And if they're not informed choices, then, then they're not very valuable. And even if you assume that they're informed choices, um, are they informed of the truth or are they informed of propaganda? I mean, think, think of the terror wars. The terror wars are a great example of this um, because we were brought into these wars based on lies. So if you vote for something based on misinformation that's being given to you by the media and government, does it justify the action of the government to follow your vote? Like, if you vote that you want to get into the terror war because you believe Afghanistan attacked us on 9-11... Um, instead of a bunch of uh, Egyptian and Saudi um, nationals that were unhappy about us interfering with their governments and just happened to flee to Afghanistan because it's not very well controlled. Um, do you think that that justifies the action of government to go into Afghanistan and be there for 20 years? And even if you think that it does, well, at this point, um, polls suggest that something like 70% of Americans think that we should be out of Afghanistan. Now, we, we are finally leaving, so maybe this isn't the best example. But these polls have been showing, you know, two-thirds or better um, of people wanted out of Afghanistan for years now. But we never got to vote on it when we were opposed to it. We only, and we didn't even really get to vote on it when we, were, um, when we as a nation were, um, were content, I guess. Um, with going into Afghanistan. But certainly now that we don't want to be there, we weren't given the option. They got that, what they wanted out of us by lying to us the first time, and once we wised up, they didn't ask our opinion anymore. <laughs> it wasn't really relevant anymore to them. And I could make the, the economic argument against democracy as well. Of course, um, the best thing to do if you have an interest in this kind of thing is to read uh, Hans, Herman's, Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, Democracy, The God That Failed. It's a fascinating book. Um, but the argument is essentially that um, public property is only exploitable by government officials as long as they're in government. Whereas, like, if you look at a monarchy... The, uh, there's an incentive to grow the wealth of the nation because 
um, you're leaving it for posterity, for your children. It stays in the family. It's something that you have access to your entire life, and the more the more you can grow it, the more you can take advantage of the benefits um, throughout your life. And the more you can grow it, the more you can leave to your children when you, when you leave this earth. Democracy doesn't work that way, obviously. And that may seem like a good thing on the, per- on the surface, but um, economically speaking, what it incentivizes officials to do is to extract as much as they can during the time that they're able to. Um, the, it doesn't incentivize them to grow the wealth. And in fact, they use the wealth of the nation to try and give themselves more time um, to extract more from the nation. Um, the, you know, they, they can use their uh, power and influence and wealth that they can access um, from their positions of power to bribe or incentivize you in some way um, to vote them in again so they can get more time to continue doing that. Uh, you hear the stories all the time about that um, not everybody who enters Congress is a millionaire, but everybody who leaves Congress is. Uh, and it's not because their salaries are so high, although they make pretty reasonable money um, doing that too, but it's it's all these other benefits that they get. And, um, and essentially the fact that they don't have to spend their own money on anything. I mean, that's not completely true, but, um, you know, they, they have access to these vast pools of, of uh, public resources to travel and, um, you know, do all these other things that presumably their job requires. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I guess, uh, you know, like a good example of why you should be concerned now, um, or uh, generally, I guess we'll, we'll go back to the specific in a moment. But you know, the democracy. We talked last week about how the people who seek power are the last people that you want to have it. Um, but democracy is is one of the worst because it incentivizes the worst kind of people. Um, it, it incentivizes uh, these kind of charismatic, uh, duplicitous people um, who maintain a public face and private activity and use their public face to uh, generate support for um, all kinds of things that you wouldn't approve of that are going on behind the scenes. And um, and it creates the situation where, it, you know, I, I think bribery is just a part of it. Just think of every... Um, Everybody running for office, what they're doing most of the time is telling you what they will give to you for free if you'll just vote for them. Now, of course, none of it's free. Um, it all comes out of, out of the of public funds, but public funds are just funds that have been stolen from the public to to support the government. Um, government doesn't produce anything on its own. Uh, in fact, the only thing that it does produce is money, um, but that doesn't actually grow wealth. Printing more money doesn't grow wealth, and printing more money, we will eventually see, uh, actually just reduces the value of that money. But again, another topic. So, I mean, part of the reason that I, I, I like I said, I don't think that, um, it's not that I don't believe democracy works. I just don't believe that it works on this scale uh, because you're too far removed from the people whose actions you may or may not be influencing through your vote. And, um, and I, I think that it works better uh, on a small scale, uh, like most things, um, works better on a small scale um, where the people know each other. And I, I'm not a big fan of the private vote, the um, anonymous vote either. Um, you know, we talk – I said a minute ago there were a bunch of people, you know, saying in both elections, well, I don't know anybody that voted for the person that won. Um, I mean, think about how that can be taken advantage of. Um, if you have a, a secret ballot somewhere – then whoever announces the winner can just announce whoever they want, really. Can't they? I mean, I know we have some checks on this kind of thing, but who would know? 
It's not like uh, it's not like it was out in front of everybody. You didn't all raise hands if you turn in a secret ballot, um, especially if you're encouraged not to um, not to share that. So, anyway, that's I, I guess that's more of a technical issue, but but it is something to consider. Is that I mean, does the the ballot really represent the the actual ballots that were cast. Do, do the ballot results represent the ballot that was cast? Um, especially if you start thinking about that the the two major parties that work so hard to limit any other um, entrance into government, um, that the two of them, for the most part, want the same things. At least on the issues that really affect your life. Um, and, and if it doesn't matter to them, actually, whether it's, uh, Al Gore or George Bush or, um, Hillary Clinton or Marco Rubio or, you know, whatever it happens to be, um, then, well, I, I mean, if it doesn't matter who the winner is, then, uh, and and they control the apparatus. Um, if somehow the unthinkable would happen, and enough people actually voted for somebody that wasn't one of the two pre-approved major party candidates, um, would we even know? I'm not sure. Ugh, sorry, needed to adjust my position here as I sit on the floor. Um, and I, I guess finally that brings us around to um, to right now with this COVID thing. You know, I, I talk about uh, lies and propaganda influencing people's choices, and um, it, you know, fear is a very powerful tool. And uh, well, I, here's an example. I guess let me let me go ahead and play this clip from Geraldo. I know that some people will think less of me when I say what I'm about to say. Uh, I think less of people who are not vaccinated. I think that it is an arrogant, selfish, reckless act. And I have five grandchildren, all under the age of 12, who are susceptible to someone sneezing on them. I think it is absolutely so selfish Mm -hmm. that it is appalling. Sometimes government has to tell, not ask. The government has to tell right now I want people to have to show when I go to the bar, I want to know everybody's vaccinated. All right. He says it's a arrogant, selfless, reckless act to not get vaccinated. Um, well, maybe. Uh, but um, I said <laughs> selfless. That's not the right word. Uh, but anyway. Um, selfish, not selfless, uh, selfish act. But here's the thing. The people that aren't being vaccinated aren't asking anything of everybody else. It's the people that are being vaccinated that are asking um, others to do what they have decided to do. And it may be a reckless act, but, uh, you know, if you're doing what you can to protect yourself, um, then it shouldn't matter to you what other people are doing. If they're not protecting themselves in the same way, then... Um, you know, well, maybe it's their mistake. Uh, it's not your place to decide. Um, but here's, here's the thing. He's saying uh, government must tell sometimes, not ask. And so what he's really saying here is that he's so afraid of what may be. Um, and I don't think at this point that there's even any reason to get into like his fear about his f- five to 12 year old grandchildren um, who can't get vaccinated since there's like when you start really calculating percentages of anything going wrong there, it becomes minuscule. There's like no understanding of statistics there. Um, If there's a one in a million chance that they'll get really sick from the virus and there's a one in a thousand chance that they get the virus that means that there's a one in a billion chance <laughs> that anything will go wrong um, with them. I, you know, anyway, uh, but he, he's so afraid of this remote possibility 
um, that f- he feels justified in using the force of government, um, the coercive power of government, to limit everybody else's rights. Like, he wants to keep living his life without fear, but he doesn't want the people that haven't made the same choice as him to be able to continue living their lives. And that becomes the danger of democracy right there, um, is that an, if enough people can be manipulated, or even if enough people just believe something reasonably, um, that, they can, that they can feel justified and have the justification of a vote uh, to limit the, the rights of other people. Um, natural rights are natural rights. They can't be voted away. And my ability to live my life as I see fit uh, only ends... Um, where it directly imposes on others. And the fear of getting sick is not one of those things. I'm, this is something that, that, you know, we all take risks every time we go out the door. Um, and, you know, you can use the traffic accident thing. Well, you know, the possibility that I might get in a wreck uh, does not justify somebody else um, in keeping me from driving. Um, the possibility that I might get somebody sick doesn't justify somebody else to keep me from living my life, to keep me from leaving my house. Um, And the same for all of you. And this is the first time, it seems to me, that this has been uh, such a big issue. Um, We have uh, had some very severe flus in the past. Um, You know, there's there's been plenty of health care threats. And frankly the the biggest one that I see right now is obesity in this country um, and you know especially when you start taking in the idea that government pays for uh, some portion of health care or subsidizes it as subsidizes it in some way um, you know which means that I'm paying for a portion of of uh, obese people's health care that they might not need if they weren't obese but that doesn't justify me in in um, dictating their diet. Even though that's probably about the most dangerous thing that they can do to themselves. Um, You know, outside of like smoking or what have you. And to end that, uh, I I guess I'm just going to end there really, but um, just to connect it back to the beginning. You know, I had a cat for 13 years before the two that I have now that I've had for 10 years. And, um, I had never been allergic, or at least I had no, I didn't notice uh, if I was allergic to the first cat. Now, you know, cats are different, um, so it may be that my first cat just didn't shed the, uh, so much of the protein that, that creates the, um, the allergic reaction. Um, but it was only, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so that I started to really notice um, that these cats uh, drive my allergies crazy. Well, I didn't even know necessarily that it was them. And as it turns out, I'm allergic to like everything. I'm, I'm allergic to dust and, and cat hair. And of course that makes me allergic to inside. I'm allergic to, uh, half the trees and all the grasses and so forth that grow around here. So I'm allergic to outside too. Um, but I didn't have all these severe allergy problems until a few years ago, it seems like. And uh, so I quit smoking in 2011, and I'm thinking that I just I no longer have that protective layer of tar in my lungs um, that kept the allergens from affecting me. And so maybe you know maybe it was a mistake to quit smoking. Just something to think about. Huh. Anyway, um, we'll be back. Uh, actually. I'm going to say a week because, you know, there's no telling. We're, we're, we're really bad at schedules. But we'll be back uh, as soon as we can um, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.